uh, exercise in civic engagement. I'm Robert Price. I'm the executive editor of the Bakersfield Californian. And uh, TBC Media is excited to, to bring this uh, event tonight, California's Energy Future. We've brought together some excellent panelists. And we're excited to uh, have a great partner in this, in this event, uh, Cal Matters. And at this time, I'd like to introduce our moderator, the editor-in-chief of Cal Matters, David Lesher. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, I am really excited about this night for several reasons. Uh, one is that uh, we have a spectacular panel here tonight. I mean, we have very top-level people. We have a diversity of perspectives on a very important issue in California and an issue that really I, I think we should talk more about in California. It's a lot of the magnitude of the changes we're making are pretty significant. Um, and I really think, you know, this panel is the best panel discussion I have seen on this topic anywhere in California since a lot of these policies passed last summer in SB 350, Senate Bill 350. So um, I know we have a, an audience out in uh, live stream land tonight and uh, as well as here in Bakersfield. Um, I'm also uh, very excited about tonight because Cal Matters is pretty new. We just launched last summer uh, publicly, and uh, uh, this is our very first public event. And so I'm very happy to be able to co-host it with the Bakersfield Californian. And so a special thanks to uh, Richard Bean, the publisher, uh, and Richard and I, uh, you know, small story, we go back to the LA Times about 25 years ago. Um, and my wife is here, and we were married 27 years, and Richard loaned us his uh, Fodor's travel guide to Spain for our honeymoon, so uh, small world. Um, and, and to Bob Price, uh, the editor of Bakersfield, uh, has been, he and I have been working together to put this together, and it's been a, it's been a lot of fun. So I want to say uh, just a little quick description about Cal Matters because we are very new and very different. Uh, we are a, uh, an independent, uh, nonprofit journalism startup based in Sacramento. We, do, we have a staff of reporters and editors. We do stories on state policy topics. You know, we do education and health care and environment. We've done roads and poverty. And we give our stories to newspapers and radio stations all around the state. So we have been published in more than 40 papers around the state. And, uh, a couple dozen public radio stations, so we describe ourselves as, you know, the largest news organization in California today that's covering these topics. Uh, and so I, there's a couple of members from the Cal Matters team here today I want to point out uh, in the bleachers here. Uh, uh, Simone Otis is, uh, Simone Cox is our chair of the board, and next to her is uh, Chris Boskin, another board member. And, uh, and Kezar Kampwala, who's the president of Cal Matters. So we're very grateful to be here to be able to co-host this event. Uh, so a little word about our format tonight and then, and then some announcements. Uh, I am going to give just a, a quick overview of some of the climate policies uh, in California, just so our speakers don't have to speak to that background. And also, we're trying to um, make this not too much of a wonk fest. So uh, you know, for people who aren't too much up to speed with some of these issues, we we'll try and explain a little bit about uh, the policies that we're going to be talking about. Um, also, uh, I would urge you to silence your cell phones. Uh, like I said, this is being live streamed, and I should do that myself. Uh, this is being live streamed, so you don't want your embarrassing ringtone going out into cyberspace, and uh, you never know where it might end up. Um, and then uh, um, I have no light here, so I got to see, uh, take a look at my notes now, and then I think. Um, a, a note to our, our panel, we have five members of the panel, and we have a lot of ground to cover. So um, you know, just encouraging uh, the discussion to move along and not take too long. Um, I'm also going to be something of an acronym cop. Uh, as, as the panel knows, there's a lot of acronyms that have to do with this issue, and I'm going to ask the audience to understand one, and that is CARB. CARB is the California Air Resources Board, and CARB is very influential in, in the issues we're talking about, and if we have to say California Air Resources Board every time, we're going to be here all night. So, so if you could remember CARB, we'll try and stay away from LCFS and RPS and and WISPA and all the other things. Um, I thought we might try and demonstrate how cap and trade works by having an acronym jar on the table, but um, 
I didn't know if that would be a fee or a tax or what, and so that was a. Um, so uh, after I um, after I give a little background, I'll introduce the panel, and then I will ask a couple questions, and then open it up to questions from the audience. So. So uh, just quickly, the background, uh, go back 10 years, 2006, uh, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger on the shore of San Francisco Bay signed AB 32, the Assembly Bill 32. It's the Global Warming Solutions Act. Uh, in essence, it said that we are going to, as California, lower our greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by the year 2020. Uh, the California Air Resources Board is uh, assigned to come up with the policies and the regulations to achieve those goals. That's why it's so important. Um, there's a lot of policies that have been worked on, but there are three that I want to mention. One is our cap and trade program that we adopted under AB 32. Cap and trade, I think we have the biggest cap and trade program in the whole world, I believe. That's, um, and um, cap and trade is, uh, is uh, essentially CARB tells many of the people or companies that emit um, greenhouse gases, here's how much you can emit. If you emit more than that, you have to buy carbon credits. If you emit less, you can purchase or you can sell carbon credits. So cap and trade. Um, the second policy that is significant is the renewable portfolio standard. It says that basically by the year 2020, we are supposed to get a third of our electricity from renewable sources like uh, wind and solar and things like that. Uh, and the third is the low carbon fuel standard. And I'm not going to try and explain what it is, but just suffice to say that it's a, it's a cap and trade style financial incentive to uh, get more cleaner fuel and more alternative fuels like biofuels and things like that. So um, about a year ago, uh, CARB did a projection about and said we are on track to m reach those 2020 goals. And a few months after that, Governor Brown uh, in his state of the state just last year in 2015 said we're on track to meet those 2020 goals so let's set some new goals for 2030 and those goals he put out three of them one is to that by 2030 we are supposed to get 50 percent of our electricity from uh, renewable sources up from 33 percent in 2020 uh, the second one was that we are supposed to increase the if energy efficiency of our buildings in california whether it's government or business or even residential, by 50% by 2030. And the third was that we would um, reduce our fuel consumption by 50% by 2030. So that bill was introduced to Senate Bill 350 uh, last year by uh, Kevin DeLeon, the president of the Senate. And uh, it went through the Senate, went past the Senate very easily, and it went to the Assembly where the uh, fuel consumption reduction provision was stripped out. And, and so the bill passed without that, but the governor has said since then that he hopes to achieve that goal anyway through executive, or executive orders and regulation. So that is the overview. Um, I hope that helps understand the, the conversation we'll be having today. Uh, and I think you can see from those policies that this is a perfect panel to talk about this. You know, we, um, I'll make some quicker introductions. You have a program that has some fuller introductions, but um, starting uh, at the, the left end of the table, or my left, your right end of the table, uh, Kathy Reheis Boyd is the president of the Western States Petroleum Association, which is the trade and lobby group for the oil industry in the Western States. Um, next to her is uh, Dean Flores uh, from the just appointed last month to the California Air Resources Board, which CARB, remember that. Uh, and Dean is a former state legislator who served in uh, the Assembly and the Senate from here in Kern County. He's a Democrat. Um, next to him is uh, Senator Gene Fuller, the senator from Bakersfield, uh, who is also uh, the Republican leader of the state Senate. And next to her, next. Next to her is um, Todd Strauss, the vice president at uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, uh, who, d who oversees a lot of their work on uh, clean energy issues. And next to him is Paul Geip, who is a, uh, a, a renewable energy analyst and the author of seven books on wind, en wind energy. So uh, you can see we have quite a, quite a good panel and a, a diverse panel. And, um, Get right to it. Uh, I'm my, the first question. I just wanted to uh, look back. Like I said, we've been uh, at this for 10 years now since AB 32 passed, and uh, just kind of get a 
report card and lessons learned and uh, uh, thoughts about how we've done, what, what the experience has been like with AB32. And I'll say one thing, you know, when SB350 was introduced, um, the governor and Senator De Leon described, uh, said it has been successful because here we are, the economy's doing well and we're on track to reach the 2020 goals. So it's time to, to increase the goals. So, um, so I'd like to uh, start out with, with just that report card and check in with everybody about it. Um, and I'd like to start with uh, Todd Strauss, if I could. Sure thing. Thanks, Dave. So just to clarify for the record, because accuracy is very important, I'm actually not vice president, but senior director, energy policy, planning analysis. Okay. I appreciate the promotion. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. So with respect to AB32, you use the words on track, quoting CARB, and uh, successful, uh, quoting the governor, and absolutely the case. The thing is, in California, everything is complicated because we are so ambitious, we're trying to achieve a lot, many different things at the same time. And so it's important to note, and I'm sure, Dean, you'll get uh, a good taste of this. In AB32, there are about 18 different programs that attempt to get greenhouse gas reductions. And perhaps one of the most prominent ones is cap and trade. You described that earlier a little bit there, Dave. It's important to note, in Europe they have a cap and trade program. There's a program in the Northeastern United States. No doubt, when you look across the world, California's program has been the most successful. Its launch was deliberate. We've actually been able to achieve greenhouse gas reductions. Prices have remained relatively low. The market hasn't gone crazy, which is one of the concerns. And most importantly, it still has the potential to serve as a model for the rest of the world. So for example, Quebec has joined and linked with California. There are many other programs. Actually, you mentioned low carbon fuel standard and the renewable portfolio standard. Those are actually considered part of AB 32 and getting to the greenhouse gas goals. So let me stop there. OK, good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to go from electricity to oil and go over to Kathy Reheis Boyd uh, for our report card on AB 32 in the last 10 years. Well, thank you. And first, uh, is, this, is this on? Everyone can hear me? Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me, and it's so wonderful to be back in Bakersfield. I've spent uh, quite a few years of my career here, and it's always great to come back and see all the old friends and some of the new ones. So uh, I wish it was under better circumstances. Obviously, the price of crude oil is a very, very difficult situation for our producers right now. Um, many are being uh, laid off from their jobs and very, very difficult time. But um, I just wanted to say that for, for, uh, for people who are in that situation, very, very difficult time for us. Um, but in this, in this space, we're talking about, I think I want to agree with, with uh, Todd a little bit on uh, the big conversation that we're having relative to energy and climate change. And it's important relative to California's leadership position because we've been at this for a while, back since 2006. I've certainly been involved since then. But for me, it's, it's really important because California's leadership in this space comes in two forms. And one of those forms is the policy design that they have put together on cap and trade. Why is that important? Because that's the conversation internationally. And we would be remiss in mentioning that there was a very important event that occurred in Paris in December. Um, and that was, who's, who's heard of COP21? <laughs> Conference of Parties, 21st century, 186 countries getting together to talk about cap and trade, representing 96% of the emissions. Why is that important? Because California is less than 1% of the, of the climate change emissions in the world. And so it's important that we're in that conversation from the design of the policies we're putting in place, because that's what the international community is talking about. But it's also important to talk about what we've learned since 2006, and I think one of those from our perspective is that a market-based system like cap and trade is certainly, or carbon tax, they're both market systems, are the way to go. And things like the low carbon fuel standard, which I'm happy to get into details, some look at that as a complementary policy and some look at it as a contradictory policy. And I can get into the differences of those opinions, and I know many in this room even have differences of those opinions. But what's really important in the climate change space 
is what we're doing matters from an economic standpoint and it matters from an environmental standpoint. And I hope we get into the, the collaborative conversation that the governor calls for to bring parties together to figure out that balance because it's the economy and the environment that go hand in glove. And I can tell you I've been doing this way too long that we make the most environmental improvements when we have a strong economy. And we're working together to figure out that pathway. It's a tough one, as Todd said. It's not easy. It's, it's complicated. But it's important from an environmental standpoint, important from a job standpoint, and all of those things are connected. I always say connect the dots because that conversation is really important. There's nobody in this room who has the corner on wisdom. Not me, not any one of these panel members. And it's gonna take all of us to figure out this pathway between now and the future where the governor and this state wants to go in a way that also looks at the vibrancy of the economy. And what that transition looks like is really, really important so that we don't have a, a negative impact on the economy while we're trying to meet some pretty aggressive goals for the state of California. So can I, just to be a little bit more specific on the report card, are, do you think we're gonna meet the 2020 goals? Well, I, I'm not sure whether we're gonna meet them or whether we're gonna surpass them, but I think what the, what the real important conversation is, is what happens after 2020, mm -hmm. right? I mean, 2020 is AB 32, and the conversation that we started having last year was what does it look like from 2030 on? And in our opinion, we really should spend time on improving the cap and trade system that California has put in place. Others, and as we've said, hooked up with Quebec and others, certainly Mexico is extremely interested. Um, and the rest of the international community is because that's the, that's the, that's the really the program of choice from an international perspective. So I think it, it really matters what the details of those, and we'll get into that I'm sure during this hour and a half, but um, I really would like to say the, the partnership of all the parties is, is the only way that we're gonna make this transition work. Because from where we are now and where we need to go is huge. Mm -hmm. It's huge. And if for a state of California that has 38 million people who drive 26 million cars, 185 billion miles a year, and we have 155,000 electric vehicles, which is great, and they're increasing, but that is, from a volume standpoint, that is not a small, and you can't do it in 15 years. So those are the details of how we are, where we are, and where we need to go, and then how do we plan that? Those are conversations that the legislature will be having, the Air Resources Board will be having, the stakeholders, whether it's wind or utilities or oil, will be having. And what's really exciting is all you are here to learn about this, and you're taking your time to really understand what that means to you and your families and to the state's economy and to the protection and the environmental stewardship and leadership the state shows. So I just compliment you all for actually coming out and to listen to, to this conversation. Thank you. And Senator Fuller, how about you? What, the, a report card on AB 32 and our last 10 years of experience with these policies. What are your thoughts? First, I just need to say that for those of you who don't know, I was born and raised in Bakersfield and actually graduated from Chapter High. I went to Richland Elementary School because the oil industry at that time paid its taxes. And we had an orchestra, and we had a band, and we had a pool, and I since my family had not gone to college and I wasn't expected to go to college, I totally credit that support for that community to, to the industry that brought jobs and money into that community. And I have a PhD now, and I'm a senator. And when my parents brought me home from the hospital, we lived in a, a rail car in the back of my grandparents' house for the first three years. And so I don't like to tell people that. I mostly, Dean knows, because he and, and I and Fran have been neighbors for years. I don't like to usually talk about that because my parents were sensitive to that because they did good and, they, and, and things got better. But I need to point that out because I am a child of the oil boom. I am. And it was a, it was a good thing. So how does the report card work? And is it, is it, are we gonna make it? Well, the way I look at it is kind of completely different. It is that Kern County is ground zero for 
energy production, and any changes that hit uh, as a result of AB 32. Yes, businesses and other people are going to be hit, but um, I don't know if you all know, but 80% of the oil and gas produced in California comes from Kern County. 70% uh, of California's oil and 10% of California's gas. And not only that, but I'm proud that we, are, we have a broad portfolio in Kern County. Kern County has online renewable energy projects with the capacity to generate 4,419 megawatts, enough to power 4 million average California homes. And that is substantially more than any other county in this state. And sometimes, sometimes, people, don't, sometimes people in Sacramento don't give us credit for that. They don't realize what the kind of energy that we produce for them. And yet, our state imports two-thirds of our total demand for oil, natural gas, and electricity. Two-thirds. In spite of us doing the heavy lifting in Kern County and having a broad portfolio and working hard to have those jobs and, and to make them as safe as we can, we import two-thirds of our total energy. That means we are dependent on other states' pricing. We are, dependent, we are sending our dollars to other states. Now, if we want our dollars to circulate in our state, we have to have new ones. You know how that is. You can't just, at home, you can't just recycle the same ones you had in your savings account. You've got to have new money come in. That's what we have to do. So I look at this from my standpoint as what is the report card for our state in, in both developing safe and reliable energy of all kinds for our state so that we become self-sufficient? And are we tracking, because we're now in the implementation stage, and as a school superintendent, that was important. Once you do the design phase, you can't just wander off. You have to monitor the implementation stage. Are we monitoring the implementation stage and reprogramming the things that would be the most appropriate? No, we are not. There is almost no tracking of this program. There is almost no accountability and there's almost no transparency for you to go figure it out. So we have some work to do in that area because we need to redesign to continue to make it work. And Kern County is absolutely ground zero. So I say the easy way is just shut off all the imports if we, if we want to get rid of all these energy. Just shut it off. See how it works. I think the governor will be impeached tomorrow. But we could do that and just keep producing what we've got, could we not? So that's obviously not the right choice, but I'm illustrating that it's, it's a complicated problem and we can meet any report card, but will it yield the results that brings our community, Kern County first and the rest of the state as well, to a better place and a better community? If we're gonna be leaders for the world, let's do it right. Thank you very much. Um, and Dean Flores, you're brand new to the Air Resources Board, and, <laughs> and um, you wrote an op-ed last year about the difficulty you're, yourself and in, in your vote in favor of AB 32, um, and, and uh, so encouraging support for SB 350. So what's your thoughts about AB 32 today? Well, um, first let me say thank you for hosting this, and it's good to be home, and I'd be remiss to not say it, but welcome my parents, Fran Flores is a city councilwoman, and my dad who worked for Mobile Chemical for 30 years and retired. So let me first say uh, thanks for both of you to, for being here. It's uh, not only uh, good to be home, but it's also interesting. I was just at Dagny's going over some notes because I'm sitting between Kathy and Jean, and I've got to go over <laughs> notes very carefully before that ever happens. And I was sitting at Dagny's and I, it was just a funny thing. I was uh, going over my notes and somebody kind of walked by and glanced at me and then walked by again and glanced again and finally kind of came over with a little courage and said, do you know if you had a little more hair and darker brown hair, you'd look just like Dean Flores? And I go, I am Dean Flores. <laughs> so uh, it was uh, interesting. Uh, so it's good to be home and, uh, and uh, let me just, uh, if I could say, uh, I'm glad you brought that up, Dave. I, I did uh, very early in my career, and I think Gene's correct. You know, anyone who grew up in this area, you know, I lived in Shafter, and to the west we saw the standard oil buses going to the oil fields. 
Uh, to the other side, we saw farm workers hitting the fields, going to the west. And so it was interesting to grow up in this very oil-dominated, uh, very job-rich country as a youngster and all the way through Bakersfield College during my time here. In fact, I think I worked just about every summer at, oil, at Mobile Chemical, and those graveyard ships kept me at UCLA, believe me. I, I wanted to make sure I got through school. Uh, but I can say that uh, it was a very critical point in my time in the Senate when AB 32 came up, and it was, uh, it was caught on the floor, and people were kind of figuring out what direction California was going to move. Uh, and in some sense, what did our energy future look like? Just very well, ba basically a topic of tonight. And uh, you know, of course, you hear the naysayers say, you know, if you vote against that, you're you're going to be out of office. Uh, and then I really kind of thought long and hard about it. But I kind of thought about my daughter about that time, and I thought about what the world might look like for her if we continued on the path that we were heading. And I wanted her to look back, and I wanted her kids to look back and actually ask the question, you know, where was your granddad when one of the biggest pieces of legislation to hit California and the nation was up? And I, and I took a vote for uh, SB uh, 32 at that time, AB 32 at that time. Uh, and since I voted for it, of course I'm going to tell you it was an absolute success. <laughs> and let me just quantify that for you very quickly. Uh, in 2006, when I took that vote, uh, we are now nearing, we'll have 10 million more people in California by the time that report card is due in 2020. And with 10 million more people, you would assume we would never hit that goal. More population, more pollution, we're not going to get there. But I can tell you that uh, what's not talked about very much is in 2002, there was a vote to move renewables to about 20 percent. And we had to meet that goal by 2017. And do you know we were already there by the time we really began to discuss how we would actually meet in AB 32, the 33% goal. So we had already been moving, and California was already on track to do this. So I was not surprised to watch Governor Brown make a standard of 50% renewables, uh, because I think we're already on that path. I think it's an optimistic path. I think the utilities get it. Uh, I think the investment that's coming into California is absolutely mind-boggling. Half the investments and half the jobs in terms of the growing sectors are now here in California. And, you know, of course, the cap and trade, I think, as Kathy said, is, is very, very complex. It's complex because California has led that effort. We regulate about 600 industries, 600 entities in California. And I'm proud that 100, about, well, nearly 100% of them comply. And 100% of them participate. And people are looking at the system and making it work. And I think as we start to think about the, the outgrowth of the cap and trade, I'm more excited the fact that uh, there is a lot going in terms of those further investments into disadvantaged communities. The Central Valley has a whole host of those. For the first time, I think CARB is actually looking very deeply at the affected census tracts where disadvantaged communities live. And I'm very, very thankful that the pro tem appointed me to this committee because guess what? They're mostly in the Central Valley. And a lot of those communities are right next and at the pollution center. So yeah, I will also say that uh, part of being on the board is a lot of talk about climate. You know, the climate and Paris and the world and all that, what are, we're only 1%. But I can tell you for me to be on this board Climate change is just a subset of pollution. Pollution is what we have to continue to focus on and will continue to focus on on the board. These other things, and, and climate change is obviously a, a very deep, deep issue that we need to solve, but I think the NOx and the SOx and the diesel and the methane and the dairies and the things that we have here in Kern County are still part and parcel of what the Air Board needs to continue to focus on. So I'm very, very happy to be on the board. I want to bring us back to, if you will, in some sense, the total solution, which includes carbon, but it also includes good old-fashioned pollution. And I, when I say I'm home, I should also say I'm home to 52,000 adults in Kern County that have severe asthma. I'm here in Kern County, the home of 22,000 children with severe asthma. I'm here in the home where 17% or three out of five kids carry an inhaler to school. We have a ton of work to do. 
on the California Air Resources Board. And I think, as has been mentioned, uh, cap and trade is, is complex. It is necessary. It has been successful. But uh, in terms of the programs we mentioned earlier, the 18 or so many, many programs at, at the board, it's, it's only my first week and I can tell you, I wish we had more. <laughs> I really do. I think giving diversity and choice and markets and things that for industry can come and actually make some choices on what works for them and trying to comply and look at the various programs at the board are all fantastic. Whether you're trying to change your vehicle out for a better, more efficient uh, vehicle, that's a positive. If you're looking to come to the board to try to find a low carbon fuel, a mixture, uh, that's, that's diversity. I mean, in Kern County, we have Crimson Oil, right? We have uh, Crimson Energy. We have, uh, Jake Beelan is retired, but we have uh, Kern Oil. You know, we have some fantastic stories here in Kern County of the diversification of moving away from fossil fuel and trying to diversify and give choice to consumers. And at the end of the day, I think that's gonna benefit consumers. You know, we have a choppy, choppy, choppy petroleum industry. It isn't because of cap and trade. It isn't because of the low carbon fuel. It's because we live in a world market. And world outages and things that happen in other countries and things that happen not just here in our borders all affect the ebbs and flows of the employment. We need to diversify to a point we can even out those ebbs and flows. And I'm very excited to be on a board now that's very, very focused on how to diversify our energy sources. So I'm super, super happy to be on the board. I've got a steep learning curve and a vertical curve that goes straight up. But I can tell you, when I was in the Senate, we passed a whole monumental, a, a, a huge amount of bills to make sure that we brought industries into the fold in terms of clean air. I had worked with a lot of folks from the environmental justice community who were absolutely fabulous to make that happen. I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize, recognize Tom Franz. Tom, thanks for being here. It's been many years. You still have your hair. I don't. <laughs> uh, but I, do, I will say that it's going to take that kind of cooperation. We talk about industry, but we also need to make sure that the environmental community, that the environmental justice community, the disadvantaged communities, the communities that live out in McFarland and Arvin and in Pond and in Button Willow, and I used to tell my colleagues that in the Senate, their eyes would glaze over and wonder what country I'm talking about. But I can say that those communities are the communities that really benefit the most from the kinds of things that CARB does, particularly on the pollution control side, on the short-lived climate issues, on the methane issues, that's what's gonna make a difference and it will absolutely contribute to the carbon issues that CARB is facing as well. So I'm pretty excited to be here and thanks for telling me what CARB was. I was kind of wondering by the time <laughs> I got up there, so appreciate that. We all need to learn that. Um, so I, I am sensing, I'm not sensing enthusiasm or criticism of AB 32. It sounds like we're still in the middle somewhere. Am I, I don't think, am I, I actually, all I this actually right, don't or? think we're in the middle of AB 32. I think we're gonna surpass that okay. very easily. I Good. think we're going to be successful. Kathy's mentioned the success of cap and trade. I'm gonna put, put a little asterisk on that. I think that uh, we're definitely there on the renewables. Uh, the fact that we have some alternatives now, trying to lower our footprint with carbon and fuels is a positive. How we get there, of course, can be debated, but I think we have a whole bunch of tools. I think that AB32 was a success. There's no doubt about it, absolute okay. success. And I'm glad that uh, we're moving to 350 because uh, the only way I could remember 350 is that there are 350s in it. And I, you know, and I think if you think about it, all of those goals are absolutely right. You have to be optimistic. No doubt we're in, in oil country, but just to the east of us is the Hatchapies. Just to the east of us is a whole new generation, a whole new look at renewables leading, if you will, in, some, in the nation in some sense. As much as we'll talk about oil, at some point we'll talk about the wind generation and the Tehachapi's and how Kern County transitioned in a very strong and optimistic way to a new economy. And I know that's hard. I know Rockefeller had a tough time with that when we talked about kerosene. And I know Edison pushed really hard to kind of move to electricity. And there was a big battle there. If you watch the History Channel, check it out. It's a fascinating documentary on that battle with Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan and, and Edison. But you know, that was a tough transition as well. It's always tough when you're transitioning to the new economy. So I would say that we just have to kind of stay focused and be optimistic and, as Kathy said, work together to try to all get there. Good. Okay. I just want to make sure we had a clear report card. Yes, sir. What's good or, or not? And Paul, your perspective on AB 32 and, and how, what, 
put his son for well, California. Well, let me first say it's, uh, I'm happy to see that Dean's on this panel. I'm happy to see that Dean was appointed to CARB. Uh, it's good to know that somebody who's concerned about the air quality in the valley is at CARB uh, because this panel, when we first was proposed, air quality in the valley was not part of the topic of discussion. And it's now a part of the discussion and because Dean is here, it's a focus of this discussion and I think we should keep it there. You asked me to give a report card on SB 32. I give it an F. I give it an F because it's a target that was built on hype. It's unambitious. At the same time, it will easily be surpassed. It'll be surpassed because of the way that we count renewable energy in the targets. So yes, we're going to surpass the targets, but it was unambitious. So let me give you a sense of scale. Today in California, new renewables only account for 14% of in-state generation. Total renewables, so that includes all our old hydro plants, brings us up to a whopping 20% after 10 years. And a fair portion of that was built 30 years ago. We're just now getting to where we should have been 30 years ago. Denmark today gets 50% of its electricity today from renewable energy. Italy gets one third of its electricity from renewable energy in country, not buying it from Germany. Uh, Germany gets 33% of its electricity from in-state resources, again, not buying it from France or Denmark, and Spain gets 33% of its electricity from renewables today. Now, if you want to talk about ambitious targets, it's not 50%, particularly the way we count renewables, which we can buy from anywhere, Mexico or Canada or Wyoming. If we want to talk about ambitious targets, let's consider what uh, Scotland proposes by 2020 to be 100% renewable in electricity. Denmark proposes that by 2020, 50% of its electricity will be from wind energy alone, so that doesn't include the other renewables. 100% in electricity and heat, and in Denmark they do use heat by 2020. And 100% of electricity and heat and transportation, that means they have to eliminate oil in transportation by 2050. In Germany, their target is 50% in electricity by 2030 and 80% in electricity by 2050. Those are in-state resources. They're not buying them from somebody else. Those are ambitious targets. And most of the analysts today, when they're looking at renewable energy targets, they're not even talking about 100% anymore. We're talking about 200% renewable energy, 300% renewable energy, because we not only have to meet renewable energy in electricity, but in heat for our buildings and cooling for our homes here in Bakersfield, but also in transportation. If we're going to offload passenger vehicles, electric vehicles, we're going to need a lot more electricity. So people are looking to the future today are not talking about 50% renewable energy and electricity. They're talking about 100%, 200%, or 300%. Now, if you had those kind of targets, I would give you an A for ambition. Thank you. Um, so I want to ask one, one question about fuel and then another one about renewables. So we'll come back to this topic. Um, but I want to ask first about fuels and, and uh, start with uh, you again, Kathy Reheis Boyd. Um, just the governor's goal of 50% reduction by 2030, could we do that? Uh, and if not, you know, what do you see the pro going forward, how our fuel consumption will, um, what's the projection, what's your forecast? Yeah, and, I, and uh, let's, just to, to follow up a little bit on what Paul said, um, you need to put that in context of what are the energy demands in this country, right? By 2040, 2040, it's not that long away, 80% of the demand is still supplied by coal, gas, and oil. And so it's, you, can, you can put ambitious targets on the table, and targets that are ambitious are fine as targets, but they can't be done in the context of ignoring facts. They have to be part of that conversation when we talk about how, where we are and where we're going. It's great that wind and solar have quadrupled, 
but they are still a small percentage. It is not as if we can start tomorrow and completely turn over the entire transportation system in that aggressive a time frame. So I keep going back to it's not, it's not that everybody doesn't want to make sure we can reach these goals as we go forward, but it's the, it's the how, it's the what, it's the cost, it's the timing, and all those things are really, really important because I guarantee you, every one of us in this room does three things when we wake up every day. We expect to turn our lights on, we expect to heat and cool our homes, and we expect to drive from A to B affordably and reliably. Now that can look like a really different mix in the future, but there is an issue of where we are and where we're going and how we make that bridge. Diversification is wonderful. Nobody puts, even in, in their own stock portfolios, puts all their eggs in one basket, right? Diversification is key. But it is in the context of facts and where we are, and those cannot be ignored. So, you know, can we reach these goals again? I, you know, I don't know. But are, are, is everybody trying to reach these goals in a way that does not impact jobs in the economy so that environment and the economy are hand in glove? We cannot, I will guarantee, we cannot get there without one or the other. They have to be both, and that conversation has to be both. And it's in the context of, you know, employment. It's jobs and employment. So I just, it's wonderful to have ambitious goals. I appreciate that. But I also appreciate the reality of the situation and where we are and where we're going and what it takes to make that happen. So I think in the area of fuel diversification, in the area of electricity, which I'm sure um, Todd can talk a lot about uh, relative to how one can transform the electricity side of the equation. But I also want to talk about the cost of that to the consumer. Let's not forget that these programs and policies, all meritorious, have an impact to the consumer as well. And when you look at cap and trade, which now deals with all emissions from fuels, fuels are under the cap, so all the emissions from fuels from cars are within the cap and trade. The impact, according to the California Energy Commission and the Air Resources Board, is 10 to 12 cents a gallon. Okay, that's a price signal. But if California is the only one that's doing it, all we're doing is increasing the cost of fuel for 1% of the climate change emissions. People outside of California probably think that's wonderful because they're not incurring those costs. So that's why that conversation is a bigger one. That's why everybody has to be in the conversation. It can't just be California. It's not a leader if no one's following you. Now we're getting people linking and that's good, that's great. But that needs to expand if we're not gonna be the only ones incurring that cost because the consumers are incurring it. Low carbon fuel standards at the very low end of that program without even talking about what that even means, it's 4.3 cents a gallon. We pay the highest gasoline taxes in, in the entire United States except for Hawaii. 60 to 70 cents more. Why? Because we've got a great clean burning you know, fuel. We make the cleanest burning gasoline and diesel on the planet and that was a joint effort with the Air Resources Board and our industry and the automakers. So you know, we've done a lot of things to help in this transition but there is a cost with it and how that impacts the consumer as we transition is a really, really important conversation, especially relative to the jobs that are needed in the Central Valley, in the Inland Empire, that don't benefit from some of the coastal regions who don't have high unemployment. You know, it'd be great if everybody could, you know, drive a Tesla. They're rather expensive still. We've got great technologies on coming out on uh, hybrids and, and even on the zero, uh, zero emission vehicle side. But it takes a lot of subsidy, $125 million for 59,000 cars in 2012. So, the, I mean, the state is moving aggressively to reduce our fuel consumption. I mean, do, will it reduce, or what, what's your expectation well, here, about where this here's trend an is going? Outcome, here's an outcome, an unintended consequence of reducing fuel consumption, right? Our entire state infrastructure is built on the gas tax, okay? If it, we haven't figured out yet what's gonna happen when we're starting to have less consumption. 
We, all, we already know where the gas tax is going, in the tank. We're 300 billion, as Senator Fuller well knows, 300 billion dollars in the hole in this state on infrastructure. So if it's not gonna come from the gas tax, I'm on, a, I'm on a commission right now, appointed by the legislature, to talk about where is it gonna come from? It, are we gonna tax electric vehicles? Is there gonna be some other, you know, avenue? Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Uh, Dean Flores, what's uh, your thought about the looking ahead at fuel consumption and? Yeah, um, well, let me, I, I don't know where to start my, my friend Kathy. I think that's, the consumer is, has to have more choice. And I, I'm a market guy, so I think, uh, you know, when the consumer has some, some more choices uh, beyond gas, mm -hmm. then I think we'll be able to actually do that. So let me just give you, we're talking about 10 cents, 5 cents, 6 cents more, you know, 8 cents more. How about a dollar less for gas in a some sense, right? Or that's, that's our framework. But I think how about a dollar less for the same mile traveled we want to move to electric vehicles, and it doesn't have to be a Tesla. You know, there was a time there was seven models, now there's 70. And let me just kind of give an example of this. So you want to really, so, so you know, energy costs are about, for the equivalent from a mile traveled, about a dollar less if you're getting in a, an electric vehicle. And I get the skepticism, but let me just point out a little side note. I like history. So uh, if you think about battery cars, electricity, the state of technology, where we are with batteries now, the cost of it going down substantially. I always like to point to a study. There was a study uh, by Ma Bell. We remember all Ma Bell from the old days. In 1980, they said, you know, 1980s when the first cell phones came out, they asked the question to a very reputable McKinsey and company, you know, what's the cell phone market going to look like in 2000? This is now when I was in high school and they're looking 20 years forward. McKinsey came back, a very reputable firm, and said, by the year 2000, in terms of cell phones, given the clunkiness and the battery and the not lack of them, kind of like we're talking about cars now, there'll be 900,000 900, cell phones in the year 2000, just 1980. Well, 2000 hit, and we sold 900,000 first day. And the second day, we sold another 900,000, and then we sold 120 million. And right now we have 8 billion lines 20 years from the time that study was asked. And I use that because why did that occur? Why did this disruption occur? And it wasn't because people looked out and said, too clunky, battery life won't go that far, won't work. It was the fact that we innovated towards a better battery. It became, for the consumer, a cheaper alternative. Anybody want to turn a landline on lately? compared to your cell bill. And then we also found the fact that communities who didn't even have that took a huge leap. Absolutely a huge leap. I mean, there were communities today in the world that actually took a leap from the landline that didn't even have the capability to a cell phone. So I am very optimistic, very optimistic. When we look back 20 years from now, as they did there in 1980, McKinsey Company saying 900,000, I have no doubt that we're going to burst past 1.5 million electric vehicles very quickly. Our society tells us that. Our consumers choose that. But you have got to give them the choice. And I'll tell you, consumers are going to pick a dollar less in mile traveled on electric than they are a dollar or eight cents or six cents, wherever we're arguing about today, for petroleum. It's going to be a mixture and it's going to happen very rapidly. It's going to happen very quickly. And Elon Musk is going to look like in the dust by the time the rest of the automakers start to kind of move in this direction. And that's already occurring, as, as, we, as you know. Mm -hmm. So do you see a 50% fuel reduction by 2030 as realistic? Or? I do. I mean, but it has to have the mix of the things I've mentioned. You have mm -hmm. to have, so Obama's new uh, fuel efficiency uh, okay. regs go in effect. You have to put communities closer, a little bit closer to each other. I think we're starting to do that. We're getting wise on that now. And, and we also have to kind of find the right mix for electric vehicles, alternative fuel vehicles. When you do all of that, I believe it's 4%, 17%, and another 10% uh, on the factors I've just mentioned. You've already hit just about that number. Mm -hmm. And that's facts. That's not me kind of throwing it out. That's just kind of what it is. 
but I think what we're missing is the fact that the state of electric vehicles today is no similar than we were with cell phones in 1980 when we were talking literally about the convenience and something of using something of that sort. That's a technology that's going to move very, very quickly, mm -hmm. is my view. Uh, Senator Fuller, um, your thoughts about the governor's goals uh, of a 50 percent fuel reduction in 2030? Well, I think it's very simple. I think we can hit the 50% gold with ease. The, the problem is, is what human behavioral changes do we want to make in our society? And how much do we want to pay for it? And you cannot, you cannot hit these goals without huge human behavioral changes. Just from as simple as if you're going to save electricity in your house, you have to turn off the lights all the time. Now, yes, you can, you can get technology that turns the lights off for you if you have enough money to buy the gadget and if it's developed, technologically developed. So you have to go back to, does our state want to be the ones that forces in a socialistic way behavioral changes on people or do we want to let the market and the technology that we are very, very good at innovation drive the change at its pace? There's a fundamental problem that we're all disregarding when it comes to looking, when it comes to looking through <laughs> people's eyes and saying, okay, I do like certain kinds of, of energy better than other kinds, but there's high heat energy and there's low heat energy. And all of you that know about fuels know that high heat energy fuels are things that drive trucks and carry big heavy loads and low heat are generally things like lights, and somewhere in between there is the electric car, right? Okay, and the low, the low heat ones, probably we can change to sooner, but the high heat ones we don't have a good replacement for, and it's very expensive, and other states are going to be ahead of us. So how are we gonna truck our groceries? How are we gonna truck our, our ag? For our region, the human behavioral changes are very, very tough changes. Very, very tough on our economy, very, very tough on us. We have long ranges and the technology is not there. The battery technology is not there. But San Francisco, honestly, it's far easier for them. They could hit it sooner because if you look at the way they, they do stuff, they have a harbor right next door. They don't have to truck stuff long distances. And they can use electric cars, and most people don't even have a car in San Francisco. They rent one when they have to go somewhere. And there's a, there's a whole tighter pattern. So for me, it's really about, as a legislator, it's easy for bureaucrats to sit and decide all the stuff that's coming, and it's exciting, and it's kind of wishful thinking. What type of behavioral changes are you forcing on people by their region? And our region is going to be hit the hardest, so we have to speak up the most. So if you go back and you look at, would we tolerate rationing of high heat intensity fuels? Would we? Wouldn't bother some people at all. In San Francisco, probably doesn't matter that much. But here, almost everybody in the economy would be affected. Would we? Would we be able to drive electric cars on a regular basis to our work and, and to our places. Well, I commute to Sacramento every single Sunday and every single Thursday, by the way, and I cannot do it in the current electric cars. And it would cost us twice as much. I calculated out that if we were to go to the electric cars tomorrow to get the same, to the same cost, it would, everybody would have to be, buy twice as many cars for twice as much if we did it tomorrow. Can we do it? Yes, we can. Do we want to force these kind of changes on people? That is the bigger question. So for me, I think we need to look at it a more regional. I'm, I'm glad, I'm, I'm really glad to work with Dina on certain projects like, you know, the sludge project. I'm forever grateful that you started helping us get rid of the sludge from LA and we're still fighting that. We haven't won that, but you were certainly a champion in that because that solution was an LA solution, not a Central Valley solution. And that is the same problem that we are having here today. So, can we hit it? Some people will hit it with very little pain. Our area will hit it with a great deal of pain 
And oh, by the way, I haven't even gotten to, but I know it's, I, need, I need to make it short. I haven't even gotten to the middle class is leaving because they can't afford to, to work here. And the, the workers' replacement is really, really hard. And why can't they? Because these costs are going up exponentially, especially in places uh, like this. And not only that, but CEQA needs to be reformed. CEQA has many good things that it's helped us, but it, the refusal to modify it in the face of the changes they're asking us to make is ridiculous. Thank you. So, Todd, I want to get to renewables uh, about that provision, but also I'm sure you're involved in the electrification of cars, and, and uh, SB 350, if I'm right, uh, called on the utilities to put charging stations all over the all over the state to lead towards more electric cars, correct? And it described it as infrastructure, but I, I think you know we started out talking about where we've been uh, with AB 32, right. and we kind of it feels like we're stuck here in the panel now as we try to go forward. So let me offer something else. Let's leap ahead to 2050 when we're looking to get goals of massive carbon reduction. 80% less than 1990 levels. What will it take? That is the challenge. And we're kind of stuck thinking about that. You may have heard the term, let's walk out here, inflection point. Inflection point is when there's no speed and no acceleration. That's not what we have in California. What do we have? Tremendous acceleration. Things are coming faster and faster. And so our challenge is, how do we get there? How do we get there at reasonable cost? Two points. Self-sufficiency. California has never been self-sufficient on electricity. And our renewables targets, we in California have greatly benefited from federal tax credits and from Chinese industrial subsidies for solar PV. And our customers are great beneficiaries of that. And that's been good for California. And we continue to lead the way in California. Now look out, I see many customers. Who here is a PG customer? Raise your hand if you're a PG customer, okay? Feels like a lot of them. Who here has solar panel on your roof? Raise your hand if you have solar panels on your roof. One, two, three, four, more than a dozen people here, okay? Kern County also has our customers, about half of them are low income subsidized rates. And one of the challenges is thinking about, we wanna promote solar panels, we wanna promote renewable energy, and we got to make it affordable for the massive amounts of folks, half the, our customers in Kern County, who are on subsidized rates. And there's a real challenge to balance that, to get those environmental goals, to keep the cost reasonable, and to keep the electric system safe and reliable. But we can get there, and it's accelerating, and PG is confident working with the rest of the state working with parties, working with industry, government, that this can be done. And California has a history of doing that. So I think we need to look up, jump, leap ahead to 2050, and then work backwards. 